And joining us now on the debate in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Janice McKinnon, professor of fiscal policy at the University of Saskatchewan. In the nation's capital, Jeff Norquay, principal with Earnscliff Strategy Group. And with us here in studio, Mel Cap, professor in the School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Toronto, and Matthew Mendelson, director of the Mowat Center. I'm really glad to have all four of you here this evening because you all so nicely combine uh, real hands-on experience in government and also in academia or the private sector well. We've got all the bases covered here. And so you're the right people to have for this discussion. Jeff, get us started because you recently declared the death of executive federalism and the rise of the Harper Doctrine. As we unpack that tonight, start us off by just telling us what's executive federalism exactly? Essentially, it's the system that we evolved in Canada for managing jointly uh, federal and provincial programs, largely in the social and health policy sector. It dates back to the 1950s and 60s when we were putting in place in this country the architecture of the modern welfare state. As the need for major national social programs like health care, Medicare, came to, came to be realized, the provinces simply did not have the fiscal capacity under the Constitution to pay for these new responsibilities. So the federal government stepped up and said, okay, we'll help. And so what evolved then was Medicare, uh, federal government uh, support for post-secondary education, uh, rationalization of the welfare system through the Canada Assistance Plan, and the federal government began to make significant contributions to those provincial programs, however, with strings attached. Hmm. This created a fairly complex system that required some management, and so that's really where executive federalism came from. And as we all know, the most visible manifestation was more or less regular first minister's conferences hmm. of premiers and the prime minister uh, where they would fight out the contributions the relative costs and how the system would work. In which case, Mel Cap, the most recent example that many people are talking about these days, the take it or leave it offer on health care that the federal government made. Would you call that an example of traditional Canadian executive federalism going off the rails? Uh, no, I don't think it's going off the rails. Uh, it's about time somebody stood up for me, the federal taxpayer. Uh, As opposed the, to you, the provincial taxpayer. Quite so. Now, sometimes, you know, they, people say there's only one taxpayer, and sometimes it feels like it's me. I'm the only one paying taxes. <laughs> but I think that the uh, challenge here is really whether the decisions are being made in an executive context, prime minister, first ministers, sitting down behind closed doors and cutting a deal. Well, they didn't do that this time. Uh, it's true that the Minister of Finance came in with a, a, a take-it-or-leave-it offer, and he said, here's what we're doing. But I just want to come back to something Jeff said. Uh, we had, at various points, collaborative federalism. Uh, this government, in its 2006 speech from the throne, talked about open federalism. That was Prime Minister Harper trying to create a new lexicon. Frankly, open federalism lasted about a week. Well, we're going to get to that, actually. We'll talk about open federalism as we go on. Janice, I want to get your opinion, though, on the Premier's, I guess, gambit. They call the unilateral move by the feds on health care funding unprecedented and unacceptable. Now, in your view, what does that signal in terms of how the provinces and the federal government these days handle big issues? Well, I think actually the federal government takes a pretty pragmatic approach. The Prime Minister did not sit down and talk to the Premiers about health care, but he is going to sit down and he's going to talk with the First Nations about education. And so if you look at it, I think really what's happened is the federal government has said, okay, we have uh, the Premier of Quebec leading the pack saying, well, you know, we have to have a dialogue. But by the way, don't you dare tell us how to spend any, any of the money you're going to give us for health care. Mm. And then maybe you could have a discussion with them about the formula that you might distribute the money on the basis for the formula. Well, you know, some of them didn't like the per capita. They wanted seniors to be taken into account or innovation, but they don't do the trade-offs. It's just all add-on, more and more. So it's just about m money, wrangling money from the federal government. Let's look at the First Nations. Why would the Prime Minister be meeting with them? There's a new chief. He's interested in reforming the education system, which is dismal on reserves. And there's some hope that the chiefs, if you get them all together in a room, at least there'll be some kind of consensus for change. And then maybe the federal government will put money into First Nations education if they can see the prospects for change. So one would be 
a waste of time and really not very, very, not very comforting to Canadians to watch that one on TV. The other one, there will probably be some bad press for the government, but at least there's some hope of getting some concrete result. Now, Mel Cap was secretary to the cabinet when Jean Chrétien was prime minister, so he had the federal, if I can put it this way, view of things. Matthew, you're deputy minister of the Ontario government at Queen's Park, obviously, so you may take a more provincial, I, I, I don't mean that in a pejorative <laughs> may, sense. May, I, I, I take that as a compliment. Okay, uh, view of things. How do you see this whole executive federalism evolving under Harper? Well, I, I think uh, these uh, forms and styles of federalism come in and out of fashion, and there's no doubt uh, that Stephen Harper ideologically uh, thinks the federal government should be involved in fewer things. The federal government shouldn't be involved in various aspects of social policy. That's a long-standing view of his, uh, and uh, there's dispute and debate within the Canadian public about that, but certainly gradually over time he would like to see the federal government play a less active role in social policy. Ideally, the federal government would still play its important mm. role in equalizing fiscal capacity so that all provinces can have uh, an opportunity to provide comparable levels of public service to their citizens, but that the federal government would cut checks um, and leave the operation of most social programs, health care, education, to the provinces. You okay with and, that? And, and that doesn't mean you don't get national programs. Um, what we saw in uh, Victoria last week was lots of possibilities about premiers coordinating various aspects of health care. And you can take an example like our education system. The federal government isn't involved uh, in primary education. They cut some checks uh, for some social transfers. But the, the primary education system, grade 6 in BC, looks a lot like grade 6 in Nova Scotia. And that's without the federal government. So the actual delivery of health care, it is a little bit different from province to province. But the systems look remarkably comparable. And that's not necessarily because the federal government is forcing that. Under the umbrella of the Canada Health Act, as long as we have a single-payer public system, as long as that continues to be an important uh, principle and piece of legislation, which Canadians, not the federal government, but Canadians rally around and Canadians are committed to, Canadians hold their provincial governments accountable. Canadians want to make sure that the public system uh, stays uh, vibrant. And provinces largely um, can do it by themselves. Let me just get some reaction to that because I saw Mel shaking his head during part of that answer. Well, look, uh, I don't think it's reasonable to expect the federal government to be a tax and transfer machine. If they're going to tax Canadians, Canadians expect them to deliver services. They don't expect them to give money to somebody else to deliver it for them and then have no control and no accountability for the delivery of that service. So Janice points out, you know, no conditions were, were put on the money and Matthew <coughs> says that's the way it should be. Well, at some point, I think the federal government should be pushing for a common economic and social union. Let's get and some reaction out of town. Okay, Jeff, I see you shaking your head now. Well, okay, but Mel, you know, we have uh, the five principles of Medicare. They remain in place. Beyond that, what the Prime Minister basically is saying is that when it comes to reforming health care, it's the provinces that have to do it. We all know that health care in this country has to change. It has to seek new ways of delivery. It has to become more efficient, more effective. The federal government, by the way, has not stepped away from that at all. You know, the federal government puts about a billion dollars a year into such programs as the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, which builds innovation infrastructure in the provinces, which helps health care. It puts about uh, another uh, billion dollars a year into Canadian Health Infoways, which is uh, digitizing medical records. So, uh, you know, you talk about accountability, it's very, very difficult for the federal government to say, oh, okay, Ontario, provide more home care, pay your doctors less, uh, run your hospitals this way or that way. That really is within the responsibility of the provinces. And by the way, if the federal government were to come along and try to do that, most provinces, provinces would quite clearly say, Mr. Harper, take a hike. Janice, follow up on that if you would. Yeah, yes, exactly. I mean, I think this Prime Minister does believe very much in, in the sanctity of provincial jurisdiction, but I think if there was another Prime Minister there from a different party, it's, pro it's just practical. The, the, the federal government simply doesn't have the capacity to tell yeah. the provinces what to do with their health care dollars. Even if some provinces might want it, want the federal government to do so, the others would not agree. And so it's just not possible. And so you're banging your head up against a wall trying to tell the provinces how to run a health care system. 
I disagree with Mel. I don't think they know how to run a health care system. I don't, think they're, I don't think the federal government's expertise is on the ground. What are the issues that, that are the most important issues in health care? I think it's the provinces. But it's not a theoretical debate. It's a, it's a very practical reality. The provinces are clear right across the piece. You can't tell us how to run it. So what are they supposed to do? They don't have any levers. Mel? Well, I, I mean, I don't disagree with anything people have said. I, I mean, it is up to the provinces to deliver. The question is, should the feds be in the business of transferring money uh, and then the province is deciding to displace that money and put it into other priorities, other po priorities that may be important locally but have nothing to do with health care. Uh, the federal money isn't necessarily incremental money. Money is fungible. It moves back and forth where the priorities go. We have a problem here if you can't ensure that, and think about the way the Martin deal worked. And I was, uh, Paul Martin. Uh, uh, pardon? Paul Martin, I presume. Paul Martin, uh, yeah. when yeah. I was out of the country at the time. But he, uh, you know, he said in the early years of this deal, the money has to go into wait times, it has to go into specific items, and the provinces say, sure, give us the money. The one thing I agreed profoundly with Janice on is that this is all about filthy lucre. It's about how do you get the most money out of the, pro out of the feds that you can. It isn't about reform of the health care system. Matthew. But, uh, on some things, mm. I think Canadians do expect and want the federal government to be a tax and transfer machine. Uh, I think that for uh, a lot of uh, programs, one of the important roles of the federal government is to take taxes from across uh, <coughs> Canada um, and redistribute them from wealthier regions to poorer regions to ensure um, that kids in New Brunswick uh, can go to good schools, just like kids in Ontario or Alberta. I can't believe Alberta. what I'm hearing. This is um, all about equalization, which we only, Matthew would only allow us to do in one program, the equalization program. We can't equalize through the health well, transfer. I, I don't want to talk about equalization at this point. We can come back to it in a second. But uh, what I do want to point out, though, Mel, uh, is that the federal government's role um, in raising uh, taxes from across uh, the country and redistributing some money um, is is a key federal role um, and I think you agree that the federal government has very little ability to manage the details of health care systems and health care delivery. I don't Agreed. think the federal go Canadians expect um, uh, uh, the federal government to deliver programs. Where the federal government can deliver programs in health care, I mean, they do have important roles. Uh, <coughs> they have important roles in epidemic uh, prevention, they, the security of the blood system, approval of technology well, and drugs. They do have They're, original health care, too. And, and then, and then and aboriginal health care. And that was that well. And that was the last thing on my list, which yeah. they do extraordinarily yeah. poorly. Yeah. Um, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, it's I, complicated. I I'm, I'm not being me, overly critical. But what I think that we're moving towards as, uh, as fiscal constraint occurs, as deficits are on the rise, I think a lot of Canadians, and I'm one of them, are saying that governments need to focus on their core business. Um, they need to get out of each other's uh, way as much as possible. And figuring out how we modernize our health care system within the context of a, uh, of a single-payer <coughs> public system, how you deliver health care more efficiently is for individual provinces to do and provinces together. And the federal government has very little value add. Let me try this with you, Jeff, because uh, you know yep. I, I need a long-time Ottawa hand to answer this one. One of the reasons we're talking about this tonight was that there was such a reaction when the Harper government made this take it or leave it offer to the provinces on the subsequent health deal they're trying to, I was going to say negotiate, but they're not negotiating. And I guess what I want to know is, is that unusual to do a, a take it or leave it thing? Um, this is a really interesting play that the federal government uh, just pulled off. In fact, many people around here believe that for Mr. Flaherty it was the play of, of 2011. Uh, and I don't mean that in a, in a dismissive way. Basically what the federal government did was they jumped over the wall of all the arguments and all the considerations that people thought would be brought to bear on this issue through fevered first ministers conferences and health ministers conferences over the next three years. They just simply said, here provinces is dependable and predictable funding. The 6% per annum uh, increase year over year is extended beyond 2014 up to 2017. And after that, the formula changes slightly to what they call nominal GDP, which essentially means uh, no less than 3, likely 3.5 to 4% a year. And so what the federal government did was, and you know, I, I know it's characterized and styled as a, a, a take it or leave it. They basically said, provinces, what do you want? 
You want predictability. You want certainty. You want to know what the federal government is going to contribute to you over the next 10 years on this vital, essential national program. Here it is. Hmm. Janice, let me get you to follow up with this. It, I, I presume an, a, an objective look at the numbers, as Jeff has just done, would suggest that. Those are pretty generous numbers. And they are predictable unless the government changes its mind, which they can do, but they've said they won't. So if we take them right. at their word, the provinces know exactly how much money they've got to spend on these things going forward <clears throat> for many, many years. My question right. is, does that obviate the need to still have negotiations, as is the tradition in this country? I think it does, because in practical terms, I, I, I think it's the play of 2011. I really agree with what Jeff said. Because what we faced otherwise was 18 months of haggling, wrangling, back and forth, not talking about other substantive issues, to come to probably about exactly this after all of that. So I think they've taken the calculation that they're going to do it this way. I think why they're going to get away with it is because it is a fair, I would actually say generous offer. I mean, look at what happened in 1995. Uh, the biggest yeah. cuts came to the transfers. Now the biggest privileged area is the transfers. And for people who are worried about the capacity of the federal government to exercise influence, this is a huge decision. Because as a finance minister, I look at the numbers. Really, the danger was that if they kept health at 6%, health was going to start eating the federal budget just like it's eating provincial budgets. So basically, by constraining health, they have some money left over for their own programs, and they do have their own social programs. They have excellent social programs, national child benefit, employment insurance, all the seniors' benefits matter. All of these, these programs yeah. matter a lot to Canadians as well. So I see them as having, I'm not sure this was their intent, but having protected some of their fiscal capacity for other programs. And now it's up to the provinces to do the same with, with their health spending. Okay, Mel, I'm going to get you now to pick up on something you talked about right near the beginning of our conversation when you talked about open federalism as opposed to executive federalism. How much of what we're seeing right now is, in fact, open federalism? Well, I think um, everyone has talked about how Prime Minister Harper, in particular, has said he wants to respect the provincial jurisdiction. And so he is a 91-92 Prime Minister. Explain that reference. And, well, section, as Jeff points out in his article in Policy Options, uh, Section 91 is federal responsibility. Section 92 is provincial responsibility. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. And there's a sense, in Prime Minister Harper's view, and Matthew points this out, that they're, they're watertight compartments. That, you know, if you're responsible for defense, it's a federal responsibility. Leave us alone, provinces. If you're responsible for international trade, it's a federal responsibility, not the provinces. Well, guess what? We can't close military bases in some provinces without consulting with provincial premiers. You can't engage in an international trade negotiation without involving the premiers. Nothing is watertight, just like health. And Matthew goes down the list of federal involvement in health. I think he's right. But therefore, <coughs> you've got to work together. So Harper starts off in 2006 and says, open federalism. That was a speech from the throne. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, one of the early things he did was the reference to the uh, Supreme Court on securities regulation. Uh, and we have the take it or leave it offer on uh, health care. I, I don't, I'm not sure that the provinces would feel that's very open of him. <laughs> now, I, I don't, like I say, I'm not saying this critically. I think that uh, there's an argument that says, okay, uh, life is complicated. We're going to deal with it this way. I think if life is complicated, we need complicated institutions to deal with it. So I'm not uh, much of a fan of this watertight compartment hmm. sense of the Constitution. Where are you on that, Matthew? Well, there's no doubt Mel is right that the watertight compartment notion is a little bit false. Things bleed into each other, of course, every day. The question, though, is how you manage that. And uh, when Mel says it's about complex institutions to manage it, I don't think First Minister's meetings are necessarily complex institutions. Um, they are largely shows. I, they're political theater. Um, and so there is a, a difference of style here, not necessarily substance. Uh, <coughs> Prime Minister Harper's preference is not to have two-year public conversations about how you deliver health care. Fine, that's a stylistic uh, difference. But the fact is that provinces, some to some extent premiers, but ministers of health and ministries of health are now going to be working together. And there are all kinds of ways that the health bureaucracies are working together. Um, for example, in Ontario, in Toronto, uh, we read MRI 
um, outputs from Newfoundland because Newfoundland has decided it's more exp it's uh, uh, less expensive and more efficient to send them electronically to Toronto and have them read here. So you have all kinds of integrations starting to happen between provinces on northern remote care using technology, and sometimes that will involve the federal government. Sometimes you do interact with the federal government, particularly on things like Aboriginal health care, um, where uh, where the provinces and the federal government are often involved on pandemics, on a whole bunch of things. But it doesn't have to be big picture first ministers. It's where necessary. I agree. I agree. Well, let me go to Janice on that, because I, I presume when you were finance minister in Saskatchewan, you probably participated in your share of, you know, if not first minister's meetings, then at least certainly finance minister's meetings where all 14 jurisdictions would get together. I mean, we've heard here at this table that most of that is just showbiz, and there's actually very little that gets done there. Do you agree with that? <clears throat> I essentially agree. Um, I think that if, if you look at the successes in the past, you know, the creation of the National Child Benefit, the infrastructure program, a recent one, three levels of government, um, the federal government out of its watertight compartments, working with the other levels yes. of government. It's really hard work on the ground that, that, that gets you to results. But I think there's a difference. I think this government thinks differently. I was listening to Mel, and, and you know, one of my friends said, Canadians are so much about the process. Was the process right? <laughs> I think this government is much more end result um, oriented. Yeah. So we need to deal with this health <coughs> thing. What's the best way to do it? Well, heck, that's going to be awful. 18 months of that, let's do it this way. We need to deal with First Nations. We're going to have to sit down with them and talk about it. I think the issue to watch, though, to see exactly whether it's ideology or pragmatism, is the national securities regulator. Uh, have they given that up? If they haven't, they will have to go back and deal with the provinces. And, you know, if, if in fact they are end game oriented and they still think there's enough provinces interested, then I think you're going to see a different process and you're going to see them sitting around together. Jeff, let me ask you about this because I, I can't remember who said this to me once, but they said in the United States, they, they asked the question, should we do this or should we not do this? In Canada, they, they don't ask that question. They ask the question, who gets to do this? The feds of the provinces. Is this a federal or... Pre yeah, exactly. Is that a crazy way to run a country, a or what do you think? Um, well, I think Janice is right. Uh, and the premier of her home province, I was on uh, another channel with a few days ago, and he said, you know, Canadians uh, are interested in stuff that works, uh, not jurisdictions, not responsibilities. I'd also say that the watertight compartments uh, issue is a bit of a straw man. Um, I've talked about the death of executive federalism, uh, but I'm not touting uh, watertight compartments. The reality is that in order to make this complex federation work, the two levels of government do really have to sit down regularly and work together. Let's look at a, a couple of examples. Um, we have a real issue in this country with foreign credentials, credentials of foreign workers. Mm -hmm. The federal government and the provinces have been very, very quietly beavering away at this in the back rooms, no first minister's conferences, no big arguments in public, and they're about to announce some bilateral agreements and some deals that are going to move that issue forward. Janice mentioned infrastructure, work very, very well. Genomics research, you know, for example, the federal government has put a billion dollars into genomics research over the last decade. And uh, that money has been leveraged almost 100% with provincial contributions. So innovation is another area where the federal government has said, look, we have to, this is an issue that hits us both. You see the um, Ottawa, cit citizens of provinces are also citizens of Canada. They all have an interest in innovation. We need to work for this on this together, and they are. The, the foreign credentialing issue is a perfect example of where federal and provincial governments are going to work together, where there aren't watertight yep. compartments, because the federal government is responsible yep. for immigration. Um, so the yep. federal government is responsible for deciding who gets into the country. And, the um, and if provinces are looking... who gets to be a doctor and who doesn't. And who, who gets to do a doctor. And, and they are also much more familiar with their own workforce needs and saying we need nurses, for example, in our province. And so that interacts with, uh, with the federal uh, immigration system. But that's not, the, that's not the stuff of first minister's meetings. That's not, there's nothing sexy about that. Um, that is slowly making progress um, between governments uh, behind the scenes. To, to quick points. I, I totally agree with uh, the, this last exchange and uh, as Janice said, I think it is, um, it's problem solving 
that we want our politicians mm -hmm. to deal with. We want them to take the problems that preoccupy us and fix them mm -hmm. for us. So I don't think it is actually about process. And in fact, a lot of effort has gone in, and Janice mentioned the national child benefit. The, the worst thing that could have happened to the national child benefit was that premiers and first, and first ministers would take ownership of it because it never would have happened. But it was done under the radar and it was delivered and it was a huge success. So I think there's a lot of very positive things that can be done without involvement. One last point though, if premiers and, and prime ministers meet, it, it does generate a huge amount of effort in the bureaucracies in capitals all across the country. Mm -hmm. And that also is a, a way of stimulating good, positive work activity. Some Good. of it's not so positive, but some of it's, most of it is. It could be constructive. Some of it's constructive, you think? Quite. Okay. Let me try this. Jeff, uh, let me bring you in on this. I, I really want to, I want you to explain to me how Stephen Harper's new definition of federalism is different, except when it isn't. And here's where we go here. Uh, we've talked already about the national securities <coughs> regulator. I mean, securities is a provincial right. responsibility. He's gone to the court to try to get some control over that to get to a, a national situation and the court rebuffed him. Uh, there's also the new omnibus crime bill uh, in which the federal government has passed laws and basically told the provinces, now you go do this. So do we have a new style of federalism here under Stephen Harper except when we don't? Um, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, and I guess the other comment that I'd make is that there are always exceptions that prove the rules. Um, in the case of the National Securities Regulator, the federal government's considered opinion is that it makes sense to have one securities, national securities regulator than, uh, rather than having 13 across the country with the 10 provinces and the, th the three territories. Um, that's an argument that they advanced. Uh, they were taken to court by the provinces and the Supreme Court decided against them. And I think that one is over. As far as the other one is concerned, the cost of the omnibus uh, justice legislation, uh, yeah, look, there are always arguments um, in areas of joint jurisdiction, and this is one of them. There are a lot of estimates, and that's all they are at this point, uh, on the part of the provinces as to what the cost impacts will be. And I think we'll see what happens on that one in two or three years when the numbers come in. But okay. I think you ask, you ask a very good question about, about the crime bill, and that highlights the fact that um, sometimes there are areas that uh, intersect, that uh, they overlap, and it's not very productive because the federal government's responsible for criminal law and the provinces are on the hook um, for uh, imprisoning offenders for two years less a day. Um, and so the federal decisions have huge fiscal impacts on the provinces, and you could change that. I mean, the federal government could upload most uh, correction services, and then they're responsible. Didn't it's their dime. I didn't see them doing that. <laughs> uh, no, no, they haven't, but right. some people may start to put pressure on them. Hmm. And this is an example where you have this kind of overlap. You do read all kinds of tension and conflict. And I, I personally think it's really unconscionable for the federal government to pass uh, the kind of crime bill legislation <clears throat> that it's passed and then expect provinces to pick up uh, the bill uh, with no compensation at times of really high deficits. Well, let me read something, uh, and Janice, I'll get you to comment on this first from your fellow Westerner here, Tom Flanagan, who was in the Globe and Mail the other day, writing the following. Classical federalism and classical liberalism are philosophical siblings. Both are premised on limited government enforcing necessary rules of conduct, but not trying to direct civil society. In the Canadian context, the revival of classical federalism is an essential part of the revival of classical liberalism, with emphasis on smaller government lower taxes, and balanced budgets. <clears throat> it is good news, he writes, that Stephen Harper's conservative government is now moving incrementally toward both classical federalism and classical liberalism, which raises, Janice, for me the question, does Stephen Harper's view of federalism inescapably mean we're going to have less and smaller government in this country? I, I think he's a lot more pragmatic than that. Mm. I, I think I think that I do believe that he does have a view of the role of the provinces, and he has respect for that, and he's shown that by putting the money there. But I think that that people who portray him as an ideologue are looking at a Stephen Harper of I don't know four or five years ago. I think he's become much more centrist, much more pragmatic. I don't know. Maybe Jeff's right about the national securities regulator. I'm not sure he is because if they actually believe their own story about why they needed one, they still need one, and there's still a lot of provinces who would like to have one, including, as of today, I guess Alberta also supports it. So, if if they aren't ideologues, 
they will perhaps try to come back to that, but they'll have to do it in a different way. That can't be done out of Ottawa. Yeah. That has to be done in a cooperative way. So I don't think I'd agree yeah. with Tom. I think maybe Tom is doing some wishful <coughs> thinking there. No. Uh, I, I'm uh, somewhere in the middle on this because my sense is Harper is an ideologue. That's his point of departure on every single issue. But Janice is right. He is practical and pragmatic. And so look at the budget of 2008. That budget, uh, or 2009, that budget uh, taken in the pit of the recession could have easily been a liberal, or for that matter, an NDP budget. I mean, it's quite remarkable. Because they primed the pump so much. Well, because he did what was required. Right. It was the right thing to do, but it wasn't ideological in the least. It was necessary. So I think there's something in here. The one thing, though, that we were giving the Prime Minister credit for meeting with uh, mm. First Nations next week, um, I just want to remem remind everyone that we had a... Uh, uh, a, a federal, provincial, uh, First Nations agreement in the Kelowna Accord in 2005, which was abrogated in 2006 by this government. So it's a damn good thing that the Prime Minister is meeting with First Nations now. That sounded like a bit of a shot. Jeff, do you want to take a, a come back at that? Yeah, I'd well, like to. Uh, sure. There, there, was, uh, there was a huge agreement there at Kelowna, and there were very, very few uh, accountability issues or accountability, uh, accountability measures, sorry, in it. Uh, and uh, the federal government under Mr. Harper took uh, a different direction. Uh, for example, uh, the government, when it came in, looked at the scores and scores, indeed hundreds, of very small land claims that have been going on for years. And, you know, you were up to $15 million in, law, in, in lawyers' costs, arguing over $10 million of, of land claim, and said, stop this nonsense, stop it, pay them, write the check, stop it now. And they did that. Uh, they've taken a completely different approach on major land claims. It's three years, uh, binding arbitration, a decision, write the check, get it off the books, solve these problems. So there are more ways than uh, the Kelowna Accord to deal with the crying needs of uh, the Aboriginal communities in Canada, and Mr. Harper has had some very uh, effective and different ideas. Janice, and a brief follow on that? Yeah, yeah, yes, definitely. Um, having dealt with First Nations and, and Aboriginal issues a lot, we have, I think, uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan has the highest percentage of a First Nations Aboriginal people. I much prefer what Prime Minister Harper's doing. The problem that I had with the Kelowna Accord, why well, I think it was faulty, it was just here's the money. What's happening now is he is saying to the First Nations the right thing, I think. Look, your education system on the reserves is dismal. You want to change it. But if you want money, we want to see progress. We want to see school boards. We want to see standards. Once we see school boards and standards, then we'll find a way to flow the money, but not until we see change. And I think he has one of the most interesting relationships that I think Harper has is with Sean Atlio. <coughs> I think he sees a chief there who also would like to change. And so it's not a, this is not a small matter, but I think the approach of tying the money to specific results is extremely important. Steve, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I didn't like Kelowna. I wasn't, this wasn't an advertisement for Kelowna. It was a reflection of the fact that you had 14 first ministers and the national chief and other Aboriginal leaders agree. It just doesn't happen that often. That I'm was sort an, of surprised. Yeah, Paul Martin was in that chair earlier this week on Monday and made the point, and that, I mean, that is pretty unusual, you got to admit, isn't it? It is. To have everybody come to that agreement. Okay, three <laughs> minutes to go here. Let me put one more thing on the table. I want to know how much of what we've been talking about tonight, Matthew, to you first, is actually Stephen Harper has this in his brain and this is how he's doing things, or how much of it is, look at the facts on the ground have changed from 20 years ago when everybody remembers lots of first ministers meeting and that kind of thing. Quebec, separation, is not a front burner issue anymore. The locus of power in this country is moving west. <clears throat> How much of it is facts on the ground versus what Stephen Harper is actually planning? There's no doubt that uh, the country has changed from 20 years ago. The issues have changed. Uh, Ontario's ability to fund large programs in Atlantic Canada and Quebec and Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan 20 years ago, not the new Saskatchewan, Janice. <laughs> um, that's obviously more limited um, than, uh, than it was. So that changes the dynamic. Um, and I do think <coughs> the verdict has to be out on Harper's approach to federalism because the last five years have seen uh, quite a big recession. 
and the federal government put lots of money on the table. There was lots of stimulus spending. But the issues that are emerging, the Aboriginal issue, for example, but also the growing issue about how you manage growing uh, fiscal disparities in the country between Alberta and Saskatchewan on the one hand, Central and Eastern Canada on the other, those are huge, huge issues that are going to test um, uh, the federal government's ability to interact with provinces, to manage regions, and they're not going to just be able to dump money on it. So the, the politics of bringing down deficits and managing horizontal fiscal inequities in the country are much bigger challenges uh, than, than the Prime Minister's faced so far. Jeff, how much of this is the PM and how much is facts on the ground? Uh, a little bit of both, I think. Uh, he certainly has a particular view, uh, and a lot of it is about things changing. If we bring it back to, to health care, what does that mean? It means that provinces are much more sophisticated than they were 10, 15, 25 years ago. It means that they're probably more accountable in this 24-hour news cycle than they used to be. It means that they're entirely capable of managing health care reform in the future. And I think the Prime Minister is very simply recognizing that new reality. I want to thank all four of you massive policy wonks for coming on this program tonight and helping us understand executive federalism a little better. Janice McKinnon at the University of Saskatchewan, Jeff Norquay from the Earnscliffe Strategy Group in Saskatoon and Ottawa respectively, Mel Cap, School of Public Policy and Governance, U of T, Matthew Mendelson at the Mowat Centre. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.